Welcome in. It is Big Ten today. Great to have you with us on this Tuesday. I'm Dave Remsen. We have some hockey awards to hand out. We're going to get to those momentarily. Then a little bit later in the show, Paul Caponigri will join me to shed some light on the selections as only he can. But with no further ado, let's get to it. Our award winners are our big story. And let's start with the first team, all Big Ten picks. Michigan is half of the first team, all from that great sophomore class, Gavin Brindley and Rucker McGroarty up front, Seamus Casey on defense. The other three selections split between three schools. The Gophers, Jimmy Snuggerud, Artem Levshnoff, the outstanding freshman from MSU, and Wisconsin goalie Kyle McClellan. The second team dominated by the Gophers, Rhett Pitlick, Ryan Chesley, and the outstanding freshman defenseman Sam Rinsel. Rest of the team, Dylan Duke of Michigan, Notre Dame's Landon Slaggart, Scooter Bricky from Ohio State, and MSU's freshman netminder Trey Augustine. And then let's get into the individual awards. Adam Nightingale of Michigan State is your coach of the year, and with good reason, Nightingale led MSU to its first Big Ten regular season title. They'll be in the NCAA tourney for the first time in a dozen years. Won 16 Big Ten games, a half dozen more than last season. Levshinov taking a couple of awards, winning both Defensive Player of the Year and Freshman of the Year. He's the only player ever to pull off that particular double. The 18-year-old who is widely considered to be a top 10 draft prospect is the Spartans' first freshman of the year in the last six seasons. The aforementioned Kyle McClellan, the Big Ten Goalie of the Year. You probably know the story by now if you follow Big Ten hockey. He didn't play a ton for the Badgers last year after transferring from Mercyhurst, but has had a fantastic season. He tied for second in the nation in goals against average. He leads the country with seven shutouts, tied for the National League in save percentage as well. And the Big Ten Player of the Year is Michigan's Gavin Brindley. Won the Big Ten scoring title with 51 points, including 24 goals, becoming the fifth Wolverine to top the conference in scoring. That is two more than any other school. Given all the success of Michigan hockey through the years, he is somewhat surprisingly just the second Wolverine to win Player of the Year and the first in eight years. And Gavin Brindley joins us now. He is our big interview. Gavin, congratulations on winning this award. Somewhat surprisingly, in my mind, you're the first Wolverine to win it in eight years since Kyle Connor did so. What's your reaction to being honored in this way? Yeah, I know it's a pretty cool achievement for sure. Um, definitely helps when you got a uh, hell of a group of guys behind you and um, coaching staff that wants you to exceed on a day-to-day -day basis. So um, all the credit goes to them, and I'm just, uh, I'm just happy to, to be able to be a part of it with them. You had a really nice year last year. You were an honorable mention all-conference pick as a freshman. To what do you attribute this jump going from honorable mention all-conference to the player of the year? Yeah, I just think you feel more comfortable. Um, coming in the University of Michigan, I was 17 years old. Um, don't really know what to expect. And um, all the credit goes to our seniors last year. Did an incredible job with, with the big freshman class that we had and, and made us feel comfortable and, and made us feel like we were a big part of the team. And um, yeah, it's definitely just been a fitting year this year. And um, it's, been, uh, it's been a hell of a ride so far. It has indeed. And obviously it continues this weekend with the Big Ten Championship game. We'll get into that in a moment, but I'm really interested in your background. I mean, there aren't many great hockey careers that start in Florida. So for people who might not be familiar, give people a little insight into the background of your family. Yeah, um, I was uh, born and raised in Fort Myers, Florida. Uh, my dad's from Thunder Bay, Ontario, and uh, mom's from uh, Coshocton, Ohio. So um, dad always played hockey growing up. and was playing in the Myers in Florida and in, in the ECHL for the Florida Everblades and um, had me and, and raised a family there and three younger siblings and um, little brother plays hockey, girls are dancers and um, I don't know, it's just always been hockey. Love to golf. We get back home for the summer, but um, yeah, it's pretty, pretty nice being able to walk outside of the rink and it to be uh, 85 degrees and sunny. So um, you're, you're in a good mood all the time and it's, uh, it's a lot of fun growing up down there. It is pretty amazing the Big Ten Player of the Year grew up in Florida. Again, as you said, you certainly have hockey connections. But what is really interesting to me, 
And what kind of blew me away is that Seamus Casey, your teammate, was your neighbor growing up. So we're talking about two first-team all-conference players who grew up really close to one another in Florida. Give people a little insight into that friendship and the history there. Yeah, it's pretty crazy. Um, grew up in the same community, uh, really close to each other, and um, yeah, we just kind of started skating at the rink together. And um, next thing you know, he was turned into quite the hockey player and probably way more skilled than I was. And um, he uh, yeah, ended up coming to Michigan. He was 12, 13 years old, eighth, ninth grade. And um, I waited a little bit longer, ended up coming to Michigan as well. And now, uh, yeah, we lived together in dorms last year, lived together in a house now. And um, yeah, I can't get rid of the guy. So it's been, uh, <laughs> it's been crazy. I, I haven't known anyone uh, for that long in my life. So um, it's, uh, yeah, it's been a lot of fun. And it's pretty cool to have your best friend uh, go through it with you. Yeah, it's really amazing. How is the hockey competition in Florida? It's good. It's getting a lot better. Um, I think uh, obviously a lot of people are moving down to Florida now since they're getting they're getting the secret with the warm weather and and uh, the, the kids like growing up there. So um, the parents, I'm sure they love living there as well. And um, but uh, yeah, a, a lot of kids are moving down there, and um, a lot of guys that that played professionally they're, they're retiring down there and. Um, kids are kids are starting their lives and their hockey careers down there, and um, yeah, it's been uh, it's been pretty cool to watch the game grow down there. Um, you know, me and Seamus, we we want to do everything we can to to get back down there and help give back and and do what we can to to help these kids have have someone to look up to. And um, yeah, it's been uh, it's been really cool to see it see it grow. You mentioned that Seamus committed really young to Michigan, and then you eventually followed him. Take us through that road, because I know, obviously, it wasn't all in Florida. You went, you played juniors. So take people through kind of a, a path of someone who is as good as you were from an early age and how you ended up at Michigan. Yeah, so how it works, you pretty much just uh, play locally until you get good enough to play AAA hockey, which um, is the best tier of hockey that you can play until you go and play junior hockey. So you go, you play AAA hockey till you're 15, 16 years old. And then um, there's a bunch of junior hockey leagues you play in. I went to the United States Hockey League, which um, that's the best junior league for the States and played there for two years. And then um, eventually just came to Michigan uh, last year. So um, stayed in Florida as long as I can. And then uh, went out to uh, Tri-City in Nebraska and then um, now I found myself in Michigan. Let's talk a little bit about this team. You guys, I mean, there was some doubt, I'd say, as recently as about four or five weeks ago as to whether this team would even make the NCAA tournament. You are now clearly going to be in. How do you feel like this group turned things around from where you were, say, at the beginning of the calendar year? Yeah, I mean, I just feel like it's all confidence. Um, we've been uh, we've been playing playoff hockey since pretty much January. Um, as soon as we get back from the break, we realize that uh, we got to stack some wins here and, and sweep some weekends and um, if we want to be in it. So uh, we, we had some big sweeps the past couple of weeks and um, it was a big game against Minnesota last weekend, which was a lot of fun. And um, yeah, I just think our confidence is, is at an all time high right now and um, everyone's playing their best hockey. So it's definitely uh, it's definitely fun to fun to be out there right now with these guys and um, the sky's the limit for us right now. I mentioned the champ game coming up against Michigan State on Saturday. Give people who might not be all that familiar with it a sense of the hockey rivalry between Michigan and Michigan State. Yeah, I mean, uh, probably the biggest rivalry in college hockey. A lot of history goes back to it, and uh, this is the first, I think, Big Ten championship game that there's ever been. So um, it'll be, uh, I'm sure there'll be a lot of emotion, and um it'll be uh it'll be a hell of a game that's for sure they're they're a heck of a hockey team and um we definitely got something to prove so um we owe those guys a little bit and it'll be uh it'll be a lot of fun on saturday well they did take three or four from you this year but your win was at mun where the game is going to be played on saturday night and you blew them away i mean it was a seven to one victory so how much does knowing that you've won on their home ice give you confidence going into the game on saturday yeah, I think it definitely helps a little bit. Um, obviously, like you said, they, they've beaten us three out of four times, and um, that's not something that uh, we uh, we want to hang our heads about. So, um, I mean, it is what it is. It's in the past now, and it's a championship game. Um, Saturday night, one game, 60 minutes, and 
um, do you kind of win that game. But uh, yeah, it definitely helps when uh, you know that you've beaten them in their home home rink, and um, we definitely go in there with a little bit more swagger and a little bit more confidence to to get the job done. All right, I'll leave you with this. Biggest thing you guys need to do to win that game? Like, what's kind of the top of the scouting report against Michigan State? Yeah, I mean, I just think physicality is the biggest thing. I think uh, when you're physical, um, your intensity is off the charts and, and your focus. Those are the three biggest things for us. And um, we got some uh, some really good hockey players on our side. So um, the plays will come and, and the plays will be made. But um, we just need to focus on, uh, on three things, and, and those are the three things. Big Ten Player of the Year, Gavin Brindley. Congratulations, Gavin, on winning this award. Really looking forward to watching this game Saturday night. And, of course, best of luck in the NCAA tournament as well. I appreciate it. Thank you very much. As I am guessing you've heard by now, the Big Ten got six men's teams into the dance. Here is the schedule. we got two games coming up on Thursday. Michigan State will kick off the day against Mississippi State. Then Illinois got their mid-afternoon tilt against Moorhead State. The other four teams play Friday. Northwestern FAU is the early game in Brooklyn. Nebraska plays in the evening against AM. That's in Memphis. Purdue will face either Montana State or Grambling in Indy. And Wisconsin has James Madison. As promised, Rafael Davis is here. We're going to start by breaking down Purdue and some news literally just in moments ago. Zach Eady, a unanimous all-American, which probably isn't a great surprise. <laughs> uh, Purdue, I would say, simultaneously yep. is a popular pick to make the Final Four and to get knocked out really, really early. Right, right, <laughs> right. right. No like, in-between. There's no in-between no. with people, right? Either yeah. they have zero faith in them <laughs> or they're saying, you know what, this is their year. Yeah. They're going to be like Virginia, the year that they lost as a, a number one and then the next year won the national championship. I know that your heart is with the former, making the, the deep run. Right. Right? I, and I'm guessing your mind is with it as yeah. well, that, that you believe that they will do that. So let's leave the heart part aside. <laughs> let's do the mind. Yes. Well, why do you think that Purdue is poised for a deep run? I think they're a better team. You think about last season, even winning the Big Ten by three games, you go to the all-conference teams. Zach Eady was the only guy on first team, second team, or third team. And now just simply this season, Braden Smith is the first team all-conference guy. Fletcher Lawyer and Lance Jones, they're both honorable mention guys. And now Purdue is sitting as the number two three-point shooting team in the country. So when teams throw the kitchen sink at Zach Eady, when they triple team him, when they foul him and don't let him get shots up, they have guys on the perimeter that can make plays. And now they have athletes off of the bench. You see Miles Colvin in the Big Ten tournament, Cam Heidi. I like how this team is built. They can guard, they defend. They do a lot of different things that last season's team couldn't even put pressure on the basket off of the dribble, and Lance Jones provides that. I like where this team, and I like their draw. They got a pretty fair, easy draw. I, I would agree on both accounts. I guess the, the thing that concerns me, and again, you never want to take like one game and extrapolate too much. I mean, like look at what Houston did against Iowa State. I mean, they got absolutely yeah. annihilated yeah. on Saturday night, but I don't hear people throwing their hands up and saying, you know, Houston's got no chance. <laughs> so I, I just feel like there is this reactionary tendency that surrounds Purdue because we all have this PTSD over what's happened here yep. over these last few years. But I will say, at the Big Ten tournament, like that supporting cast, and again, I hate to use that term because, you know, Braden Smith's first team all Big Ten. I mean, these are really good players. But, mm -hmm. but Zach Eady is the headliner. The rest of that group didn't perform great right. at the Big Ten tournament. Like, I just think it's fair to say that. Mm -hmm. Again, you know, Braden had 10 assists and at eight rebounds. And I mean, but, but again, like, you didn't have any other double figure scores other than Lance Jones' 10 points in the first game. They didn't shoot the three great mm -hmm. at the Big Ten tourney. Like, I, I guess I just, on one hand, they did everything well at the Big Ten tourney last year and it didn't do them any good. <laughs> right, right, right. Like, what difference did it make? Right. So, so you're kind of speaking out of both sides of my, or your mouth, and I realize that I am doing that. But I just wish that the complimentary guys would have been a little better last week. I mean, you think about Brandon Smith. He went down with that leg yes. injury. And I know he's one of the toughest dudes in the Big Ten. He played a high school season on a broken foot halfway through it. But going down with that leg injury meant something to that team. I mean, he wasn't the same after. The team wasn't the same after. Right. It took the breath out of the arena. And I don't know if they recovered after that. But you think about it. 
their perimeter didn't play well at all against Wisconsin. Still took up to an overtime game. And that's a Wisconsin team that I feel like they can make a Sweet 16 run. So you think about Zach Eady dominating the basketball game, getting it to overtime, getting it to one possession with everyone else not playing well. I believe these guys will make shots. I think they get to Utah State. I think they get to Kansas in that Sweet 16. You look at Kansas, Hunter Dickinson's banged up. Kevin McCullers banged up. Right. Even Gonzaga, there's people saying Gonzaga shouldn't be a five seed. They kind of got gifted that. Yeah. I think Purdue takes care of business. They get to Tennessee or Creighton. I kind of feel as though to beat Tennessee a little bit. But I like the place of game these teams have to play. Tennessee's going to slow it down. Creighton's going to slow it down. They're not necessarily up against those quick out-of-conference teams that maybe they've lost to in those former years. Certainly, as we looked at that bracket, I mean, I'm not sold on anyone else in that group. I, I think Utah State got underseeded. I mean, you win the regular season in a six-bit league and you end up in an 8-9 game. I think they probably deserve a little bit better fate than that. But, yeah, Kansas is incredibly banged up. I mean, we don't know if Hunter Dickinson's going to play. Now, if he does and they play Kansas – He's not intimidated by Zach Eady, yep. right? He's he's dealt with Zach Eady before, but again, I mean, and dealing with him good though. His, no, I agree. And his shoulders <laughs> flying out of its socket. I mean, I don't know. Like, it, it's it's hard to That's to funny. envision it, but yeah. well, this is the NCAA tournament. It's a one game thing. Uh, the East is brutal. Yes, uh, absolutely brutal. You yes. look at uh, all the metrics, and I mean, it's like far and away the toughest region. I agree. So, Illinois is in there. I mean, you have to deal with UConn, who it feels like is playing the best of anyone right now. They're the defending national champs. They've got a little bit of everything. Yep. You have Iowa State as the two seed there. Yep. And I think there was a lot of thought that they might be a number one seed. They right. might grab that last number one seed. Mm -hmm. And instead, they end up playing the best of the one seeds as a two seed. Like So, yeah. they're essentially saying you're eighth. Yep which is crazy. So that's what Illinois is up against. That being said, I mean, Illinois is playing great. No, yeah, I like where Illinois is. And I think Iowa State getting a two-seed is fair because they played nobody in the non-conference. I know, but... Their but, best win in the non-conference against a tournament team was Grambling State. Okay, and I, I get that. And I do think that the committee is sending a really clear message about non-conference scheduling. Yes, but I would also say I this. Agree. Look at Iowa State's overall strength of schedule. Right. Their overall strength of schedule That's is the big high. The well, big yeah, twelve they so play with the numbers. They beat up on all the non-conference team. They beat them by forty. They run them out of the gym and they they, they kill the net. They, they found a way to trick the net. And they're playing with numbers, and that's why Iowa State. I love that okay, they but, got a two C. I love it. Okay, but I think, and I don't want to get too far <laughs> down the road on Iowa State because we're not the Big Twelve Network. <laughs> but but let's contrast it with what everyone's saying about Michigan State. Right. Right. Everyone's saying, oh well, Michigan State game the system. Right. Because they scheduled tough in the non-conference, but they lost most of those games. So obviously they had the great win against Baylor, right, where they right, right. annihilated them, which I think probably is the game that got them in. Probably. Like, if you were to look at, I mean, I guess had they not beaten Northwestern at home, right, right, right. had Ryan Langborg hit that open three, <laughs> yes. Michigan State probably wouldn't be in the tournament or I might agree. not be in the tournament. Yeah. But but I think the way that they beat Baylor made people think, okay. Yep. But but so on one hand, we're saying Michigan State gained the system because of the way they scheduled in the non-conference, and that's not fair. Right? I think that's fair. Play the games. Go play the games. I think that's what we want in college basketball. We want good basketball games in a non-conference. Don't run yeah. from people. Don't wait till conference play. Michigan State, they had their, their non-conference. They took their lumps. They came into the Big Ten and still made their way. They made their hay. They figured it out. And now they're in a good position. I'll take Michigan State. I know we're going to talk about it later. But I got them going to the Final Four. Yeah. I got no, them no. getting all the way I, there. I, I like yeah. where they're at. And yeah. you look at Illinois. I think Illinois is a team that – they get past Moorhead State. I think Moorhead State is just a little bit too slow for them. They get to BYU. BYU, they want to get up and down. They score the basketball. I don't think they have the athletes to keep Terrence Shannon out of transition or guard Marcus Domask. I think they get to UConn. And if it's a game where it's a game where Coleman Hawkins is hooked up, you can flip that matchup against Kling and bring him away from the basket. Yes. Ham Spencer cannot guard Marcus Domask. I don't care where the game is played. I think that's going to be a big one. All right. Yeah, look, I, I'm, I hope you're right because <laughs> I think Illinois is really good yes. and I do not like the way the bracket played out for them. I don't want to say it's unfair. Nothing's unfair no, I got in the NCAA tournament. But I just don't think that Iowa State should be a two seed in the region with the number one overall seed. I agree seed. with that. I, I, agree I, with I just that. think it's a, it's a really, really challenging bracket. Uh, let's get to Wisconsin. And when you talk about fashionable upsets, you get a 12 versus five, and every year people are talking about it. 
This is one people are pointing at, and justifiably so, and it really has nothing to do with Wisconsin. It has everything to do with James Madison. They're really good. We saw them go into East Lansing and beat Michigan State in the season opener. It turned out that wasn't an anomaly. They've only lost three games all year. They have the longest winning streak of any team in the country. This is a challenging matchup, but, man, I feel a lot better about this Wisconsin team right yes. now yes. playing them than even, I don't know, 12 days ago. Yeah, you look at Wisconsin. Seven days ago. Wisconsin's guards, they're playing well. Chucky yes. Hepburn is leading the charge on both ends of the floor. He's a pest on defense. We all know that, all defensive team. But what he's been able to put together on the offensive end has been special. He's knocking down threes. He's getting to the basket, finishing through contact. They're posting him. He's getting to that little turnaround jumper in the mid-range. He's been great. He's got to keep that up. You look, A.J. Store. I love Greg Gard. It's just kind of loosened it up with A.J. Store a little bit. Let him feel his way through the game. He's a big-time player. Are you referring to the past yourself off the backboard? <laughs> yes. And he kept him in the game. I mean, can you imagine? He kept him in the game. We might I love have talking about that. <laughs> can you imagine if that would have happened when Bo Ryan was coaching? Oh, man, he might have went home. <laughs> He would have got subbed out so quick. I used to be so impressed with Bo Ryan. If Frank Kaminsky would turn the basketball over, he'd get subbed out. Yep. I thought that was so blasphemous, but I understood it. But A.J. Store, you got to let A.J. Store hoop. You think yep. about it, you let him go, he's going to get you 30. You let him go, he can get you 25. He may take a few bad shots along the way, but I promise you it will average out. That's why I think they get past James Madison because I think A.J. Store is better than Terrence Edwards. I don't think Michigan State had a guy to deal with Terrence Edwards. I think he's that guy. And then you look ahead, you look to Duke. I think Wisconsin is a great matchup with Duke. I think Tyler Wall, Filipowski, I think that would be a great matchup as far as Tyler Wall being physical, keeping him out of lane, making it tough on him. But I think the key matchup is Chucky Hepburn versus Jeremy Roach. Jeremy Roach can score the basketball. He can be efficient. He's the head of the snake for that program. And Chucky Hepburn, he has been known to cut the head off of snakes and make the whole body fall. If Chucky Hepburn can get into Jeremy Roach, and maybe Jeremy gets 16, 17 points, but on 15, 16 shots, I think that play favors in the Wisconsin. I'll tell you, it's interesting that they held him out of that Northwestern game because I kind of looked at it and thought, oh, man, like this is the yep. last thing yep. that they can have here would be to have an injury. And then the next two games, he was tremendous. I, I mean, believe. you talk about defense against oh Braden Smith. I mean, that last <laughs> possession. Big time, man. Just yeah. took him out of the game. And yeah. I think Chucky can do that to any guard in their way. I think they get all the way to Houston. Right. Uh, look, Duke's a good team, good team offensively. I don't think this is a vintage Duke team. No. I don't think it's one of their best teams, and I don't think it's a stretch at all to think that Wisconsin could beat them if they get past James Madison. We still have three more teams to get to, and Rayfell and I will do that next. All three teams are in that dreaded 8-9 game. Who has the best chance of breaking through the second weekend? I think Rayfell's already told you who he thinks. Our takes are straight ahead. Our big stat, Nebraska's been one of the best stories of the Big Ten all year. They end a 10-year tourney drought. Only DePaul, Washington State, and B.C. have gone longer without dancing among power conference schools. They have an even longer drought when it comes to winning an NCAA tourney game. That drought is forever. The only power conference school that has never won a game in the big dance. They're going to try to end that against Texas A&M in a game that's got a little bit of a grudge match feel to it <laughs> yeah. from the point of view of Nebraska fans. Give me a, a sense of what they're up against here and how you think they'll be able to pull this off. They're up, they're up against one of the toughest teams in college basketball. You think of how Texas A&M will beat you. They will dominate you on the glass. They dominate you on the offensive glass. The number one offensive rebound and percentage team in the entire country. So when I look at this game, I love it for Nebraska because I look at it and there's not a lot of teams around the country with their three men being a Jawan Gary or their four men being a Josiah Alec or even having a two guard at 6'7", 230 like a Bryce Williams. I think Nebraska is built to rebound the basketball. They're built to be a tougher team inside. And then I look at Wade Taylor. Wade Taylor can win Texas A&M a game, but he could also shoot them out of a game. I think this is a game where you have to put Wade Taylor or in case a Tomanaga, just because of size. I mean, you look how big Nebraska is across their starting, four, their starting five. You can't hide Wade Taylor on a Bryce Williams. He just take him in the post. And what I think that does is k is going to run Wade Taylor off of 12 screens, 13 screens in one possession, kill his legs, get him hit by a bunch of screens. And if that can happen, if k can make some shots, it'll kill Wade Taylor's legs. He won't be as efficient offensively as Texas A&M needs him to be. And I think Nebraska can win away with it. I just think this game comes down to rebounding. Yep. Hard stop. Yep. I, I just I think agree. if they 
clean up the defensive glass or at least hold their own on the defensive glass, they win, they the, win the game. I agree with you. Right, because they can score. Yep. Nebraska's going to score. And they can. I, I understand Texas A&M is a good defensive team. Nebraska's going to score yep. because that's what they do. And and I think if they're if they're good enough defensively and good enough on the glass, I, I think they win the game. What about Michigan State? You've already told us you've got them. Yes, I do. I, I, I thought you had them to the Elite Eight, but I think unless yep. my hearing is going, which my family will will verify it probably <laughs> is. I believe yep. you said Final Four. Yeah, I had them in yeah. Elite Eight this morning, but yeah. as I was thinking about it, they got it, better as the I day went on. I'm going to the Final Four. Uh, I'm drinking the time. By 7 o'clock Kool-Aid. tonight, they'll vote in the National <laughs> Championship. Actually, I, I gotta, I'll got tell you my Final Four a little bit later. But uh, right. you look at Michigan State, yeah. I think they get past Mississippi State. You look at Josh Hubbard, a small guard. I like Michigan State in any guards game. You think of that Baylor game. If you think about Josh Hubbard, I'll take Tyson Walker in that matchup. I think that's a game that they're just going to yeah. win that one. I think they get to North Carolina. R.J. Davis is a guy that can get you 30. He can get you 25 on any given night. But you look when North Carolina lost in a championship to NC State a couple nights ago. R.J. Davis went for 30 points, but it was on 26 shots. So this is a game where he's not efficient from the field. It's really going to hurt hurt North Carolina. I think A.J. Hogard played his best basketball in the Big Ten tournament. Averaged 12 points, 8 assists in the tournament. He's finding his way. If this is Michigan State at their best, you think of their interior defense that's going to go up against Baycott. I like their interior defense in that matchup. Michigan State at their best. They take care of North Carolina. They get to Bama. It's the same story like it is with R.J. Davis. It's Marcus Sears. And I like Michigan State in guards games. You think about beating Alabama and Marcus Sears. You get to Caleb Love at Arizona. It's the same thing. It's Caleb Love can go for 30, but he can go for 12 on an inefficient night. If this is a thing where Michigan State's if their guards are hooked up on a perimeter defensively, that's going to put them in the game. And then if you got Tyson Walker going off, Malik Hall has showed flashes, and then A.J. Hogarth just being solid like he was in the Big Ten tournament, you think that Minnesota game, 17 points, six assists, six, six, six of six from the field, that's the A.J. Hogarth they need. That next game, he had 10, eight points, ten assists. They need him to be hooked up. But Michigan State at their best in this bracket, I got him going to the Final Four. I want to believe what you're saying, and I would say they have shown, I mean, again, we talked about the Baylor game, second time we talked about it in this show, but they showed against Baylor what they can be at their best. I just don't think they put it together in multiple games this year. So you're asking them to do something they haven't done, which which isn't to say that it can't be done. Right, right. I mean, at their best, yeah. At their best, yeah. At their best, guards. Right. Guards win you game in March, and then you got Coach Izzo. I met Coach Izzo. I went to his practice. He handed me a cup. And I swear it was a Coach Izzo Kool-Aid. And I drank it, and I'm a Spartan. I'm a Spartan dog, just like you, Coach Izzo. I think this is going to be one of those tournaments that Michigan State's put together, and they have one of those patented runs, and we forget about what happened in the regular season. You think that 2015 team, they had their lumps, they had their ups and downs, but those guys figured it out at the right time of the year like they always do. I wish that second game weren't in Charlotte. I mean, that would make it even it's gonna make it even tougher I wish for, for them against North Carolina. Let's talk about Northwestern. And, and again, like, I think it's an incredible accomplishment they've made it here. Yep. And I am no way going to write them off, especially against FAU, a team that a lot of people thought didn't even belong in the tournament. Yes. They end up yes. with an eight seed. Yes, it's okay. crazy, right? It is a little crazy. I, I, man, I just wish Northwestern were healthy. Yeah. I mean, I, I just, with, with Ty Berry and Matthew Nicholson, I really think this was the best constructed team that Chris Collins had to make a run because the teams that make a run in March are the teams that can shoot the three. Yep. Now, I will say this. Northwestern was still first in the nation in three-point percentage in conference play. Yes. And that included after Ty Berry got hurt in February. The issue to me is it's even harder now without Matthew Nicholson because yep. I, I just think there's not there's nothing to worry about yep. down low, right? That lob threat is gone, and so you can really run shooters off the line. I just think it's, it's going to be hard for them to win – Multiple games would be hard anyway because of how good UConn is. But yeah. it, it is a shame, but it's not to in any way minimize the accomplishment or to say yeah. you never know. You oh, have no. a you have a supreme talent in Boo Booey. Yeah, and in Boo Booey, I trust. I think Boo Booey is one of those generational players that can win you a game in the NCAA tournament. Boo Booey can go off for 40 points, and he can get Northwestern over FAU. I have no question about it. You think John L. Davis, I think Boo Booey, I think that's going to be a great head-to-head matchup, and I take Boo Booey in that matchup. I think he's good enough, and you get him in the ball screen with Preston and Hunger, and you just attack Golden 
off the dribble every single time down the floor. Golden will pick up some fouls. You make him unplayable, and then, then it's even. Then it becomes a guard's game. And if that game is close, if it's a two, three possession game with four or five minutes to go, I'm taking Northwestern every day of the week, twice on Sundays, because Boo Boo is a guy that can get you home. He's going to be a, have a good game. You need Brooks Bernheiser to make shots. You need Ryan Langbord to get going. But what you really need without Matt Nicholson, you need Mark Nelly to produce inside. You need yeah. Mark Nelly to get to those flipper doodles, as Coach Weber says, and to get some buckets inside to even out the paint production. But I strongly believe Boo Booey can go to New York and he can win them a game on his back. They get in that backpack, and then you just see what happens against UConn. New York State native. He's from yes, Albany, sir. so you know he'll be excited to be somewhat close to home. I agree with you. I think it's about the complimentary guys. Yep. I just don't think that Northwestern can win this game if everyone plays the way that they did in Minneapolis. And that includes Bowie. He was fabulous. Yes, he was. But, man, you know, Martinelli, point-blank shots, didn't make him. Langbord got into foul trouble. And then Barnheiser did not have a great game. Right. I mean, really didn't shoot the ball well at all. Interesting connection, by the way, there. Dusty May was coached in high school by Brooks Barnheiser's dad. Wow. Yeah, how about that, huh? <laughs> See, I did not know that. Yeah. That's cool. Yeah, I didn't know it either until Dusty Bruce got to go bust his, bust his head, bro. News conference, yeah, yeah. So uh, so pretty interesting. We won't even get into the UConn game, right? If, <laughs> if you beat Florida Atlantic, then go the out fun. there and, yeah, then you're playing with house money and, yes, and you, you see what happens against the team that many feel will cut down the nets. Back to hockey next. Paul Caponigri is here. Excited to get his takes on the awards that were handed out earlier in the show. That is straight ahead on Big Ten today. Saturday, a champion will be crowned in the 2024 Big Ten Hockey Tournament when Michigan and Michigan State renew their rivalry. Live coverage begins with the pregame show Saturday, 7.30 Eastern, only on the Big Ten Network and the Fox Sports app. We continue our Big Ten award reveal, the all-freshman team. It includes two unanimous picks, and interestingly, the freshman of the year, Artem Levshnov, is not one of them. Trey Augustine and Aiden Fink the only two on every ballot. The rest of the team, Garrett Shivsky, Oliver Moore, and Sam Rinzel. Congratulations to all of the award winners. All right, quick review on the Big Ten individual honors. Brindley, the player of the year. Lev Shnov, the freshman of the year. Cal McClellan, the goaltender of the year. And Adam Nightingale named the top coach. As promised, Cappy <laughs> is here to run through some of this. Yeah. Uh, let's start with Adam Nightingale. And I think you could have made an argument for Mike Hastings, right? It feels yeah, like those were like, the two. Yes. What ultimately do you think got it for Nightingale? I mean, I think, you know, winning the league. Um, you know, they both had interesting things where they had a lot of uh, fresh, they had freshmen and then, of course, the transfer portal. Right. Michigan State had 15 new players. Yeah. You, you dressed 21. So wow. now he had some good, you know, Trey Augustine, Levshinoff, right? You saw on those yeah. lists, but... He had some skilled players coming in, but I don't care. When you have that many players coming in, yeah. usually takes some time adjusting. They were good right from the start. They, he just, I don't, like he started with the culture last year, and I think it just translates. He doesn't care if he has, you know, high-skilled players or less talented, and it, it just kind of, those guys came in and bought in immediately. They started off fast, and they ended fast, and obviously, you know, won the Big Ten regular season, are in the Big Ten title game, so... Uh, he just has a good demeanor about treating everyone the same. I, Mike Hastings is very similar. Um, but it was, I think, getting that Big Ten title, uh, you know, puts it him over the top. And it's kind of a two-year award, too, for him, sure. right? I mean, it kind of started last year. They got incrementally better yes. and then just took this huge leap. And it's just really <laughs> cool now. They've restored this luster yes. of a program that was so good for years and had really fallen off. And now they get to play in a Big Ten championship game. And they're not our, going anywhere. Right, this right. is this is something, you know, both programs. You yes. know, this isn't a flash in the pan for Wisconsin-Michigan yeah. State. They are coming and they're going to stay for a while. Let's talk about Brindley. He was great. We had him on the, awesome. the interview earlier. Uh, to me, his improvement is really cool, right? Yes. To go from, you know, good, solid player on a really good team. Yes. And then now all of a sudden you're the best player in the league. What stands out as you think about his year? I just think his consistency. I mean, their team was really good all year. You know, Rucker McGordy was almost as fantastic. The only thing maybe that hurt him, he was injured, missed five games. Mm -hmm. but Gavin Brindley was there every game. He plays in every situation. He, he just, I just felt like he brought his energy every game. I just think that's so hard to do the way he plays. He's a smaller guy, but he doesn't play small. He plays big. 
and he just brings it every game. And, and, and he was better in the second half when you talked about him, when they needed to raise their game to get in that NCAA area. He was the one guy that kind of led that, you know, stampede, if you want to call it. Right. Uh, let's talk about Lev Shinov, a late addition MSU's yeah. roster. I mean, you talk about kind of the genius of what Adam Nightingale did. Sure. You pick him up in July. <laughs> Okay. A projected top five pick in the draft. Yeah. Nice little pull. Yeah, not, not bad, bad, right? Not He's bad. the pressure of the year, defenseman of the year yeah. in the league, and, and really made a huge difference for them. Yeah, and I asked, obviously, I asked Adam about him before the year to try to get a sense, like, you know, what is this guy? Because he's, he's new to the American scene just a year before that. So you didn't know a ton about him, but he just said he loves the game. Uh, he wants to be here. I think, you know, when guys come over from – you know, Eastern Europe and Russia, like it's, it's just a different world. And, you know, it takes time, you would think. But I think he, he embraced it is what, you know, Coach Nightingale talked to me about is that he, he wanted to learn. He wanted to go to class. Like there's a lot of stuff guys can be shy. They're just, you know, the, the, the language barrier too. So for him to get past all that, uh, he said he's one of the hardest workers. He's a guy that stays on the ice. Obviously that worked out for him. But I think that – you have to get some players like him to elevate your program. You can be a great coach and you can get your guys working, but you've got to have some elite talent. And I think his combination of elite talent and his work ethic and just kind of get, he's a happy go lucky kid who doesn't want to be around that a good player that works hard and he's a happy guy. Like, why wouldn't you want that on your team? And I think you saw it in his play and his teammates and what defensive player of the year and freshman of the year. That's pretty good stuff. And only 18 years old. I mean, the sky is the limit. I, I can't believe I mean, I, when I was 18, I was just barely trying to make the lineup in my junior team. So, like, <laughs> the fact that him and, you know, Brindley's 19, but he's a sophomore. Yeah. I mean, these guys doing it at such a young age is pretty incredible. And how about Kyle McClellan? I just think this is a great story. We've had some right? good goaltender stories. Yeah, uh, no doubt. In the Big Ten. But, but really just bet on himself, right? He was at Mercy yep. Hurst. He was really good. Came yep. to Wisconsin. Didn't play a whole lot last year. And yeah. then this year, he becomes one of the top goalies in the country and part of this amazing turnaround. And again, Michigan State maybe, I don't want to say overshadowed sure. Wisconsin, but kind of in tandem. At the end, in, maybe a yeah, little bit yeah. before Wisconsin was Wisconsin the story. Wisconsin was the story. I mean, I mean we were talking about that. The number, number one, one in the, in the country. country. Right, right. So so tell me about McClellan. Uh, Augustine, I guess, probably would have been the other one in that sure. conversation. Yep. Right? Yeah, I mean, the goaltending was really good. You two had yeah. Ryan Bischel was the goaltender of the year last year in Notre Dame. Justin Close was solid. Yeah. But Kyle McClellan is funny. I talked to Coach Hastings before the season. This is my thing to try to get – to know some of these players, but, you know, he didn't know who he was going to go with in goal before the season. You know, he had a, a young guy coming in, and he's like, well, he's like, I'm going to give the, 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 the senior the first shot. And he goes out, and he gets shutouts the first weekend, and it kind of just went from there. And I think, like any player, the confidence built, right? And Kyle, he knew he was getting the chance. He got to do it. He put up the numbers. And then I think, you know, Mike Hastings' teams plays a good, solid defensive structure, which helps. But his save percentage is, is the highest of anyone in the country that's played as many games as he had. He's like seven shutouts. You don't do that without some skill and net. So it's a combination of the way they play. But Kyle really stepped up um, and led the team. I mean, that's, that's where we, why Wisconsin, where they're at. The question mark was in goal, and he answered it. Yeah, I'd say answered it emphatically. <laughs> so we got Michigan, Michigan State. Saturday, you're going to be in studio wait. for that. Yep. Uh, I'm looking forward to it. Let's go. Munn is going to be... Uh, crazy is that a good word for it? I, I think it's gonna be fun. That's a good word. For I think it. the league it's just, is it's just cool, right? It's cool to have Michigan State. I mean, you look at the history of Michigan State. I know it's, it's fun. So I think that's what the whole what the Big Ten was envisioning yes. when it put together. It's just ten years it takes a while. I guess yeah. finding the right coach. Obviously, it's just hard today. I mean, finding getting the recruits and then building all around that. All right, should be fun on Saturday. We will see you on the you pregame it, show. Yes. All right. A uh, dramatic conclusion of our show coming up next. The postseason hoops actually begins this very evening. Three NIT games. Ray Fell back with me to break them down next. Three Big Ten teams in the NIT. Two of them are going to host. All three of the games are this evening. Ohio State welcomes Cornell. Iowa hosts Kansas State. And then Minnesota on the road at Hinkle. They will take on Butler. Ray Fells back with me for the rest of the show here. I'm interested to see Ohio State. It's because it's the first time we'll see him with Jake Diebler knowing yes. that he is the permanent head coach and with the players knowing that. And there was this groundswell of support for him, not just from the current players, but from former players as yep. well. I and mean, there really was this feeling 
that this was the guy they wanted leading the program. And so I fully expect them to come out and be ready to play and be excited and look really good. Yeah, you even see LeBron James going out of endorsement to Coach Diebler. I loved it. I loved the hire. I thought it was a great decision because these guys are playing hard for Coach Diebler. They are defending at a high level, giving them, giving it their all on that end of the floor. And that's been a turnaround. You got guys coming off the bench like Scotty Middleton, Devin Royal, even Dell Bonner and Zed Key just maximizing their effort, understanding their role, not worrying about how many points they're getting, how many shots they're taking, doing what it takes to win. And Jamison Battle's been playing his best basketball of yep. the season as of late. Talked to Coach Diebler after the game. He said that is our leader. He's been great in the locker room. I'm excited that their season got to continue on. I love they took the NIT bid. I think one of the challenges with the NIT every year is do you want to be there? Are you motivated? Yep. Are you excited to play? Yep. Ohio State's going to be excited to play. Not because they're in the NIT. They wanted to be an NCAA tournament team. The expectation of Ohio State every year is an NCAA tournament. But I think they're just excited, I would think, to kind of have this group still playing together and, and to be doing it for the head coach they wanted to be playing for. Yep. Iowa and Kansas State, interesting game, kind of a contrast in styles here. K-State, good defensive team. Iowa wants to get out and run. And I think, I think this is what Iowa wants to do. They want to get out. They want to push the tempo. I don't think Kansas State can score enough points to keep up with Iowa. You go back early in this season when Nebraska, who struggled on the road all season long, they went out to Kansas State and just blew the doors off of those guys. I think this could be in similar fashion. But like you said, I think it's a situation where Tony Perkins wants to continue on his career. You think Ben Cricky, they want to continue playing. They want to play as many games as they can to finish their college careers. And I think this is a time for Payne Sanford to not just solidify himself for next season for, for Iowa, but to solidify himself for next season as one of the better Big Ten players to, re, to return to the conference. I think this is a great landscape for him to do it. I really like that Iowa is still playing. We've yes, seen a lot of too. power conference schools say, ah, I don't want to necessarily Silly. be a part of the NIT. And you do what's right for your program, and I, and I get that. But I love that Iowa, a program, again, where the expectation is the NCAA tournament. They're in it virtually every year. But they're saying, hey, we're going to go out and we're, we're going to play well. You think back to 2013 when they went to NIT. They made the tournament three straight years after that. You think of those guys that were on that team that sat through that NIT. So now you look at Owen Freeman, Brock Harding, Josh Dix. Understand that they don't want to be here again. So they're going to use this as motivation to never have to come back to the NIT to go next season to the tournament and to continue that on. It's going to do nothing but help them. Finally, Minnesota, this is a team, and I've mentioned this on the air a couple times, Ben Johnson really wanted to play in the NIT. Yes. Obviously, again, you always want to play in the NCAA, but if the opportunity were to arise, he right. said we would love to do it because he has a young team, because everyone can come back next year. He looked at Wisconsin as a team that used it as a building block for this season. They made a nice NIT run last year, made it all the way to the Final Four Ben Johnson believes Minnesota can do the same thing, no, starting with this game against Butler. I agree 100%. You look at Minnesota, and I hate I have to say it this way, but if they return all of their players from this season to next season, they come in as one of the better teams in the Big Ten, probably top four in the league preseason. You think Dawson Garcia, Pharrell Payne, Elijah Hawkins has turned into one of the best point guards in the country. So it's just about getting them to grow as a team, stay together, develop them as guys, and then their bench guys. You think Brain Carrington, Josh Ola Joseph, even guys like Parker Fox, those guys continuing on their seasons. Josh Ola Joseph getting minutes in postseason. You think Pharrell Payne being in postseason. This is what these guys came to Minnesota for. I'm glad they took the bid, too. Yeah, absolutely. Going up against Thad Mata and Butler tonight. We're going to wrap things up talking about the big dance. And uh, Ray Fell, pretty active on social media, <laughs> tweeting out his faith in the conference. Yes, sir. Saying he has three teams in the Elite Eight. I believe those three are Illinois, Michigan State, and Purdue. Is yes, that right? Yes. Would that be a, a, a fair assessment? So I want you to fill us in. So that's a hot Big Ten take. You think so? I, I think so. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I don't think a ton of people would be right. saying they think Michigan State's going to make it to the Elite Eight. No. So I think it's a Fairly hot take. What are your other hottest Big Ten takes as we head into the tournament? I think Illinois. I think Illinois get to a championship. I think we're going to have a Big Ten national championship. I think if there's a team that can beat UConn, just structure wise, I think it's Illinois. I think you think Donovan Klinger, if you could take him away from the basket like Coleman Hawkins can, if you get the best version of Coleman Hawkins going against UConn, I think he wins that matchup. And there's no way in America, nowhere in America, no court, no indoor, outdoor, does not matter. Caleb Spencer guarding Marcus Domax, that's not going to happen. I think Marcus Domax is going to be a key factor in that game. And then uh, Illinois, they have the athletes to keep UConn out of transition. They have the athletes to run them off the three-point line. 
No one in the country can keep Terrence Shannon out of the lane right now. No one in the country can guard Terrence Shannon right now. He is on a heater. I expect those guys to make a deep, deep run. I would agree with the Terrence Shannon part of it. Yes. I mean, I just, man, he has been something else. Again, you're asking for consistency from a group that hasn't always been consistent. Is that, that, a, that, to me, is my that's my concern. Whereas Purdue's been consistent other than this past weekend. I think AAU teams play better in tournaments. Illinois is structured like an AAU team. They got guys that can go out there and hoop, just get baskets, run up and down. You think Illinois, this has been one of the first times where a team has forced the Big Ten to play their way. They didn't care about defense. They just wanted to outscore you. Yeah, it's pretty fascinating when you think about Brad Underwood's history that he has a team where you say, I didn't care so much about defense. <laughs> pretty remarkable. We will see you tomorrow on Big Ten Today.